have a lot of artwork from childhood and high school that was saved by my parents and then given to me because they wanted out of their house. And some of it's decent quality. A lot of it is sentimental, but I want it out of my house. I don't want to display it. It doesn't really serve anything for me at this point in my life. And I mean, I don't want it to go into the trash, but if it does, I don't want to know that it's being thrown away. So do you guys have any ideas of how I can um, get rid of it, places to give it to, um, just anything? I just need it out of my life at this point. All right, Jeff. So this is obviously we had to bring it back into minimalism in sure, some way, sure. right? <laughs> right? And so what we're talking about here is she's created some stuff in the past that she may not be proud of, doesn't really want, but also like... She wants it gone from her life, but doesn't want to get rid rid of it. Right. That often happens to many of us. Mm -hmm. This reminds me, uh, to some extent, where someone's like, I want to eat meat, but I don't want to kill animals. And, and, right. and yet, so like, I'll just pretend that nothing is going. So if someone else can hide this art for me, yeah. I think this is, we all sort of have the residue of our past, right? Yeah. And it can haunt us. You even mentioned like, oh, there are some things in this book that I, I don't like. But you also recognize that, this adds value to people's lives. And so in order for it to add value to people's lives, there's going to be things that you've created in the past that maybe you don't personally get value from anymore, but someone else might. This is more of a decluttering question, though. Hey, I have a bunch of stuff from the past mm. that I want to let go of, and I'm terrified of letting go of it. Should I hold on to it for pos posterity? Or sure. yeah. Uh, there's two things that come to mind. One is there's a little known story about Hemingway when he moved to Paris. Uh, he moved to Paris because he was told that that's where the most interesting people in the world lived and he wanted to be a writer. And he uh, had had just um, recovered from a, a wound as an ambulance driver. Uh, he, uh, during World War I, kind of drove over this landmine and, and, and got some uh, shrapnel on his leg. And... Um, and he got married, moved to Paris. Uh, it was cheap there at the time. Uh, it is not cheap there anymore. <laughs> um, no, and he, and he moves to Paris and he's writing all the time. And he's writing these stories. And um, and his wife, and he went on a trip and she, she came back from the trip to meet him. And he went back to Paris because he was working for a newspaper at the time. And he had this trunk full of manuscripts, uh, like, a, like a couple of books that he was working on and stories and all kinds of things. And she lost the trunk. Mm. And or the trunk got lost, mm. and he blamed her. Uh, which <laughs> she is, sold it on eBay. <laughs> and, and what's interesting about that is, I mean, this is kind of interesting because somewhere or at some point there are these uh, undiscovered Hemingway manuscripts that nobody has ever found. That you know, or I don't know, they're buried somewhere. They got yeah. thrown away or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened right after that is he stepped into the most prolific season of his life. He wrote The Sun Also Rises shortly after that. He wrote The Sun Also Rises in six weeks. Mm. And, and, and that was the book that put him on the map uh, and made him an, basically an overnight sensation. And he eventually became uh, one of the 20th century's most famous and successful authors. And you could say that it started out with unintentional decluttering. <laughs> And so I've got sort of two thoughts on that. One is if you really just want to close your eyes and, and let go, I think it's okay to like have somebody take care of that for you and go, hey, I don't want to know about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you guys are the expert at this more than I am. Um, but I did just move. Mm. And I had 20 years of stuff because um, I'm a very sentimental person. I had letters. I had things that I had written, things that uh, people had written me. Um, going back 20 years. And um, and I found it to be very cathartic to actually go through these letters uh, one by one. I mean, hundreds. It took me hours. And I didn't like, I, I like looked at, you know, looked at them. I didn't read all of them. But some of them I, I got, I, I re-encountered the memory of the experience of where I was at that time, who this person was to me, friend, girlfriend, parent, you know, lots of different relationships. And um and maybe three or four people, it, it sort of, um, I was like, I still want to be in touch with that person. So I took a picture of the letter and I texted it to this person as just sort of a way to like connect with them. And then I threw the letter away because mm -hmm. I was like, this is what I want. Yeah. I want the connection with the human, not the letter. And then I actually saved just a handful of them because, you know, they're nice mementos. And, um, 
and that was that was a spiritual experience. I mean, you guys know this. Mm. Um, and I wasn't I I wasn't ready for that and until that point where it was significant to me. I was starting this new chapter of my life, and I kind of said goodbye to these things while remembering the memories and, and holding on to it. I know artwork can be a little bit different, but kind of. I mean, these were like songs I'd written in some cases. Mm. These were paintings and drawings that I had or that people had given me. And I would say, you know, if there's some stuff that you want, you want people to see, cool. Like maybe go, hey, friend, take care of this for me. And I do think it could be very cathartic to go through some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Seth Godin told me once when he decluttered his library, he said that his books are his friends and he still misses them every day. And I, as an author, I love that, you know? Mm. Uh, I recently moved and I got rid of a lot of stuff and like 10 books, you know? And the other 9,000 remained. (laughs) But your works of art are your friends. They're your family. They're very significant to you. It's hard to throw them away. And you can say goodbye to them in a really beautiful way um, that isn't maybe as traumatic as, you know, your wife showing up at a train station without, you know, these these staggering works of genius you've been working on. Mm. And it's like, it's okay to just go, okay, see you later. I'm going to let go of that energy so I can go right. The sun also rises. Yes. So I can go, I can be free of the energy because a lot of work that we do early, early on is not good. You know, I don't hear you saying, this is really, really good stuff that needs to be in a museum. You have to have a lot of reps. You've got to do a lot of stuff and you can give that stuff away or throw it away or sell it. It doesn't actually matter. As an artist, you're trying to get to your best work as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is to do a lot of work and not cling to each single piece of it. Last night, we were at the comedy store and we saw this great comedian trying a new joke. He goes, I'm going to try a new joke. He, he, he read the joke. Nobody laughed. He goes, okay, bad joke. And this one woman goes, I don't get it. He goes, well, here, let me explain it to you. He goes, if nobody laughs though, I don't need to explain it. It's dead, yes. mm-hmm. you know? And you've got to be that unprecious with your work. Yeah, That's him letting go. And yeah. so from a very practical standpoint, if you need to save something for posterity, I'm grateful. Like I know a lot of David Foster Wallace's works are collected at the University of Texas. At this sort of, but it's all cataloged digitally, and I don't need the actual physical artifact. If you have, in fact, it's better in many respects to have the digital version. That way, it's backed up. If you have It'll a house fire, longer, flood, yeah. yeah, anything like that. Yeah. And so, if you really feel like there's something I'd like to hold on to for the sake of archiving it for future generations, fine. But the truth is, we don't need to archive most of our second grade artwork. Well, my mom or my my wife's mom did this amazing thing for all of her kids. You know, they collected a lot of sort of kids stuff all throughout the, the, the years, as parents often do. But what she did in the last year is she pared everything down to one box per kid. Mm. Here are the most sort of sentimental memories. And it created a boundary or a barrier. I can't go beyond this box. But then she handed each kid a very intentional Beautiful. box. And here you go. Yeah. And so if you want an intentional way to do this before it gets swept up in a flood or it just someone else comes and steals it from your house, doing that on your own, curating it in a way where it fits into a capsule of sorts and then digitizing the other things. But you're letting go so you can move forward. You can work on the future art because if I continue to cling to the books and the blog posts and everything else that I wrote in the past, it's going to prevent me from doing anything meaningful going forward. Yeah. Yeah, art is an expression of a moment and it's wonderful to have a collection of some moments, but kids are incredibly prolific, you know? What was interesting to me and I actually thought about you guys because this just happened last week, I was like, all right, kids, you know, like stuff you want to donate, put in into this box, stuff that just needs to be trashed because, you know, like the pieces aren't, you know, all together or whatever, put it in here. And then stuff you want to keep, put it in here. Uh, my kids didn't have much stuff. We've been living in an apartment for the past three years and they got rid of about 80% of their stuff. Oh, wow. And I was like, Hey, I gave this to you for Christmas. <laughs> like, and they're like, yeah, I don't use it anymore. <laughs> That's and awesome. And I was like... No, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> like, this costs some money. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard for me. Yeah. But you know what's so interesting about that is 
kids are always in the moment. They go, well, that's from six months ago. This is what's true now. Mm. And I had a lot of artwork that my children had made and I didn't keep all of it because some of it kind of sucks. Sorry, kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I would, I would keep the stuff that I really liked. I go, that was a cool picture that I want to hold on to because this is an articulation. It's a snapshot mm. of who my daughter was at five, six years old. But think of it like this, right? Life is always happening. And you could take a picture of life happening, right? And uh, one of my favorite spiritual teachers is a guy named Anthony DeMello. He's, and, yeah, he's my favorite. And he talks about, he goes, people go on trips to take pictures of places they never saw. Because you never, you never got to slow down and experience it. Yesterday we were at- I think it's a Drake line, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds right. Sounds that like sounds it, yeah. right. And it's like that, you know, mm. so much of life, even art, is holding on to moments that have already passed. Now, it's okay to take a picture of a beautiful moment, right? Like, I'm glad that I have some moments captured, but you could go through life taking pictures of every moment and not experiencing any of it. Same is true of your art. Mm. Uh, I think it was uh, Bob Dylan who said about Blowing in the Wind, he goes, I don't even know who wrote that. Oof. I'm not that guy anymore. Yes. Mm. My friend, Derek Webb, as a musician says, when he plays his old songs, he plays them as covers because he's not that person anymore, mm. you know? Yeah, and it's like good. a book. It's like, oh, I wrote that? Right. Gosh, that had to do with what I was reading, how I was sleeping, what I was eating, what I was thinking. I could mm. never write that book again. That's mm. right. You know? And so your art is always an expression of life. Keep living and you will keep making more art. And if you want to hold on to some stuff and share some stuff, cool. And a lot of times the stuff that you think is awesome, people are like, ah, and some of the stuff that you think is, is okay, people love. Mm. But keep living, keep creating, and keep letting go of the little articulations of moments that you've manufactured because there will be more moments and there will be more art. And most artists who are holding on to relics of their past are afraid that they're done and that their best work is behind them. And that is only ever true when you believe it's true. Mm. Yeah, we cling out of, that, out of fear. Did you enjoy this standalone Patreon highlight? If so, you can listen to full episodes of the Minimalist Private Podcast, available exclusively on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash the minimalists or click the link in the description. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free.